Hey everyone, welcome to another OD Wire webinar. Thanks for making it out tonight. And tonight's going to be a fun one. Uh, you know, I think we've all had a lot of spare time over the last several months, you know, with, with COVID and being at home and shutting the practice down and maybe getting restarted again. A lot of time to think about what it is that you've been doing um, and maybe thinking about starting to change some processes in your office. And so tonight we're going to start to talk about dry eye screening and implementing some technology in your office that might make screening uh, easier. You know, we've been doing this for a long time now, I guess almost 20 years. Uh, and in the old days, you know, dry eye was a problem that we dealt with uh, mostly empirically, sometimes with drops. You couldn't do too much about it. But the diagnostic technology has made absolute leaps and bounds in the past couple of decades. And that's why I'm really excited about tonight's talk, because uh, we're going to learn about some of this tech and how you can actually implement it in your practice uh, to do eye, dry eye screening. So with that said, why don't I introduce you to our speaker today. So today we have uh, Patty Barkey, who's the director of the Dry Eye University. Now, Patty knows more uh, about dry eye than just about anyone. And in, in their clinics, you know, they have a, a protocol set up. And she's going to talk to you all about what they do and how it works and how you can sort of implement the same protocol and use the same technology to build your dry eye practice out. So Patty, thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you. It's an honor to be here this evening as a part of the presentation for Lanu Technology and the Visionics VX120 Plus Dry Eye. So um, when you're looking at standardizing the practice, your practice with dry eye screening, you know, let's think about some of us have already put dry eye into our practice. Some people are just thinking about adding dry eye care to their practice. And the biggest thing I think um, along the way that I've learned is that you gotta have a standard of care. And in that standard of care is the diagnostic component to help identify and also you want things that you can identify and also use as education for your patients. Dry eye is one of those areas where the more education you provide to your patient because there hasn't been any out there in the past for them, the more images you can show them, the more uh, tools you can use and not just pictures, you know, pictures of them, but not pictures just in a book because when they look at pictures of someone else, it's harder for them to relate that to themselves. When they actually see images of their eyes, it helps them buy in and it comes a long way in the closure of certain therapies and treatments that you might wanna add to your particular practice. So let's get going a little bit on this. The agenda this evening, you know, we want to, you know, I'm going to introduce a little bit in the, tonight's program, this technology that Adam was mentioning to you. Dry eye can be, um, you know, it, it can be expensive when we look at Dry Eye University and we've had people from all over the world attend our Dry Eye University programs. And on average, we have anywhere from 28 to 30 vendors at each program. And in the program is all the diagnostics and the tools and the things you need, and we talk about them. This particular, particular technology for the right physician um, place um, and space can bring in about four to five different pieces of equipment into one. So that makes it great when you're trying to bring in a new, um, you know, a new, technology into your practice for a new disease treatment that you need a great return on investment but you need to create efficiency and you also need to create protocols yeah. and keep them compact so that you can teach your staff and educate your patients so we're going to talk about that tonight you know i'm going to share with you some of what i've learned about dry eye patients um, a little bit about how they function mentally and how you capture them and how the flow and efficiency works within the practice um, when you add them to your daily schedule. We can discuss the new modernized approach to practice management using this technology, an in-depth approach to dry eye screening, looking at what the machine offers for you, and then how you can start addressing ocular surface disease. So, um, you know, we'll talk a little bit of how you can address uh, ocular surface disease. And this is, um, you know, a point of which I want to say, you'll hear me say dry eye disease a lot. Uh, at Dry Eye University, that's one of the things I kind of put an emphasis on with uh, practices and staff and from a patient perspective. I think a lot of the physicians like to use the word, you know, use the words ocular surface disease, but for patients that sounds so foreign to them. So if you use dry eye disease, I think they can relate to that. And specifically using the word disease, uh, patients start to understand 
that a disease process, this is something that you can't cure. You're gonna be in it together with the patient. It takes a team to help control their comfort and get it under control and control the disease process. And they, they can relate to that, like they relate to diabetes or they relate to ocular hypertension. So that's why you'll hear me say dry eye disease a lot because that's really one of my favorites um, to turn and practice with the patients. Uh, a little bit about me. Um, CEO at Bowden Eye and Associates. Dr. Bowden and I have worked together about 22 years now. Um, I say if I'd met him earlier, I could teach him how to run on time. He likes to run behind. I am the implementer and the bringer of new things to the practice, and I love to create efficiencies. And um, that's why this equipment is so exciting to me, because anywhere we can create efficiencies, especially with today's constant cuts and reimbursements that we're experiencing, I know next year we're looking at anywhere from a nine to 11%. I, I saw a thing today where some exam codes were cut about 13% for next year. There were some that were increased, but the majority of the cuts are across the board. So that's kind of my role at Bowden Eye. And I have a staff right now around 80 something. I've been as high as 90 something. We're lower right now. Um, Director of Dry Eye University and Dry Eye Access. I was the creator of Dry Eye University. I had so many practices visiting us early on trying to figure out how to implement some of the new technologies that you know, I decided let's start a program where people can learn and more people could learn at one time. So that's where Dry Eye University came about. We've had 17 different programs. The last was in Colorado earlier this year. We usually have three a year, but this year we've only had one because of COVID and we'll probably have our next one in February of next year. So um, that's been fun along the way because as it was created, so many things have changed. You know, processes, standards of care, there's been new technologies like crazy. You all look at journals and every journal you um, touch has an article about dry eye or ocular surface disease or diagnostics or new procedures that are out there. We're seeing a lot of heavy competition right now in some of the diagnostic areas as well as MGD treatments. You're seeing, you know, really jockey in for space out there. So that's been a fun part. Dry Eye Access is a web-based educational um, tool to help practices grow dry eye and educate their staff in the practice. I'm the VP right now of American Society of Ophthalmic Administrators and the Administrator Program Chair for Hawaiian Eye. I've been in ophthalmology now for 41 years and I have literally worked, I think, every job in the practice from scrub tech to technician to insurance and billing to optician. I think I've done everything but be the physician. And so I tend to have a wealth of knowledge in all these different areas. And that's what helps me really work on efficiency and integration for our staff because I've done those jobs and I understand where their frustrations come from. Right now with EMR and MIPS and all the things we have together, um, it just takes so much time and we need to put patients through efficiently but also create such a great experience for these patients um, so that they want to come back and they want to send the rest of their uh, family to us. Dry eye can make up about 70% of the patients that walk through your door. And, you know, that's an important thing to keep in mind as we're thinking through the process of this uh, equipment tonight. Because if 70% of your patients are walking through the door and you have things to offer to them that no one else has ever been able to offer before, and you can capture those technologies or those treatments or you know whatever it is you decide to put into place, think of the revenue and the return on investment you can get. Plus that patient experience will drive more patients to your office. The things we know about dry eye is that, you know, not every practice is offering dry eye care. And if you're the one in your area that decides to really embrace it, patients appreciate it so much. When we first added it to our practice, I called it the beast. And the beast would just, it grew and grew and grew. Those patients multiplied every day. And I encourage people to start out, you know, really taking care of the patients in their office before they advertise and put it out on the street, get your processes organized, get your processes efficient. And then once you get those things in place using your technologies and you've, you're tried and true with it, then you can start advertising and bringing in more patients to the process. So ocular surface disease, is 
you know, the symptoms, there's ocular surface disease symptoms and, you know, patients talk about signs and symptoms. You hear the drug companies talk about signs and symptoms. And the thing about this is being able to use a tool to screen as well. Patients, many of them are asymptomatic when you start dealing with dry eye. And this is an important thing because if you can screen and you can have findings from the signs that the equipment will pick up and you can educate using those signs and show them to patients on their eyes, you're going to be a hero along the way because you have the opportunity to stop the progression of the disease um, and maybe even stop the patient from getting to the point where they're very symptomatic. I always wonder why when I hear providers say, well, the patient's not symptomatic at all, so I'm not going to start anything right now. We'll see them back next year. So in theory, what we're saying is we're going to see the patient back, and when they're really struggling, then we're going to take care of them. But why wouldn't we try to pre pre prevent that um, from happening for them? Um, to develop the Dry Eye University program, we looked at those things. We looked at, you know, we had to research ways to provide enhanced patient care. How could we fit dry eye into our already busy schedules? And I hear this a lot from other providers. I'm so busy. I don't have time to add anything new to my practice. I don't have time to hold hands of these patients. And, you know, we categorize these patients as mild, moderate, and severe. The mild patients, you know, many of them are asymptomatic. Those actually require more hand-holding than your moderate or severe patients because the moderate or severe patients have something to measure as far as if they're getting better or not. So we were looking for ways to enhance that patient care. We looked at, you know, how could dry eye screening lead to capturing and how could it improve um, and increase revenue? So think about it. If you're, increase, if you're able to care for these patients, get that ocular surface under control, and you're working on a referral network where you're referring patients to surgeons. One of the big things here is that, you know, we're constantly, because we're a practice that has MDs and ODs in our practice, and our ODs may do exams and send the patient over to the surgeon for cataract surgery. And even though everybody in my practice treats dry eye, the surgeons want to receive that patient with the ocular surface under control so that they can proceed to A-scan measurements and whatever they need to be able to, especially if they're doing refractive cataract surgery, to be able to proceed with the surgery. The last thing they want to do is say, you know, I know you came today getting ready for cataract surgery, but we need to put you off while we get this ocular surface under control. So you can be somewhat of a hero when your surgeons really start to receive these patients and they're already taken care of. So we looked at those things. We looked at embracing the new technologies that came along the way. And it led to us to create, you know, kind of a national recognition for our program. And my big emphasis when developing the program was standard of care. And I think you have to have a standard of care. You just can't willy nilly, you know, try this, try that. Really understand what's tried and true. Really understand what diagnostics you can use to help identify these patients and then once you identify the patients base your treatments and your offerings to the patient on what you have identified and be tried and true to that for every patient that you see without picking or choosing or judging the patient based on whether you think they can afford the new technologies or not and then the, the development of dry university came along to share this knowledge that we had put together and help other practices grow and be able to take care of patients and that's where technology like this came into play. One of the things we talked about along the way was if all you, this is a Bowdenism, I call him, my big guy. If all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And we talk about this often, but you know, between us and the tools we have and what we're putting into place, you know, if all you have is a slit lamp, then all you have is a slit lamp to use to try to identify everything that comes through the door. If you have a slit lamp and you have something that can measure meniscus height, now you have two different tools and you can start talking about two different things and everything's just not a nail that you're looking at. So this is an important concept when you think about what you have to have. You need certain things to be able and you need to be able to identify certain things to be able to properly take care of these patients. We'll talk a little bit more about what would work with this technology, what else you might add to be able to be almost complete to be able to really identify and um, set up your diagnostics for these types of patients. So um, 
that's where we started going out and after we developed dry university we really started looking at um you know helping the other md practices and od practices and dry university is a mixture of ods and mds and it's really fun to watch them all come together and they're all learning something new for the first time or they're trying to grow their practices and with the exception of scope of license you know most things in dry eye can be done by either md or od until you get to more of a surgical area where your state license may not allow you to do that so when we look at this visionics you know the vx 120 when i first heard about this i thought what you know what is this and um, i've got to see this and you know when it was first um, introduced to me, I said, well, can we get this to try in our practice? And at first they were like, well, what? You know, and I really wanted to be able to try it and put it in place and see what could happen. Because remember, I mean, I have everything. I have, you know, I've had, I had the first tier science system, well, the fourth tier science system in the state of Florida, ninth in the nation. So we've had ours so long that we had every tool there. We've added every tool along the way. And suddenly I'm being shown something that was encompassing a lot of tools into one specific box that had such a small footprint and was so efficient that it was kind of hard to fathom that this could even take place. When we showed this to our providers at a provider meeting, um, I think Melissa was who, you know, she actually did a, um, we popped in like a webinar and showed it to them. You know, when we hung up the phone, they were like, well, we could go out and do um, eye exams like in shopping centers in place with this. It just felt like there was so much um, capability within one box. So let's look at it a little bit. Um, here you can see the image of it on the screen. Uh, the footprint, it's a small footprint. Notice the um, image display that can be used to educate the patient. So the images show up on the screen. And that education is such a critical key to capture in these patients. You know, how does it apply to me? What, what it, you know, show me what my eyes look like. My refractive coordinator in our practice, because we do refractive surgery, um, she was so in love with this because while I had all these other technologies around, what would happen with her is she would have to go room to room to room to use the different tools within our practice. So, you know, her exact quote she gave to me is she said, the VX120 is great for quick data gathering. It's very user friendly. I could get an auto refraction, a corneal topography, pack imagery, and an IOP check all within minutes per eye. It is literally like a robot tech of the future. I love using it for my refractive screenings to get a quick snapshot summary of patients and to guide them into the best refractive options for them based upon refractive error, CT appearance, and the packs. I love being able to get all of these data points with one machine instead of bouncing the patient from room to room. I can pull up the data on the desktop and click through each piece of data for the patient to see as we chat. And then not to mention, I can get the dry eye pieces because she's a refractive coordinator. She kind of has to throw her dry eye counseling on to the end of the um, refractive screening process. So she could now get all of this within one room without bothering the clinic or going into their areas of diagnostics. So, you know, it has all of this plus non-invasive tear breakup time, anterior ocular photography, tear meniscus height measurements. There's just so much. So she was super excited about this to have it in our practice. The, um, this is a, you know, an image. It can take up to the place of four different devices in the pretest room, provides all data within 90 seconds. One instrument with the anterior segment analysis uses wavefront technology. What was really interesting about this and what our staff loved as well is we did um, as young as a four year old on this piece of equipment. Now I know not all four year olds would let you do that, but we were able to because of its quickness. If you could explain, I mean, you know, yes, it might take a little bit longer to explain it, but if you can gather all of this fast in one chair with a child, it certainly is uh, foolproof at that point because we can think of how long those exams can take us for children. Um, it, the learning curve for technicians is so um, simple. They're learning one device instead of four devices. The patient sits at one device instead of moving. One of my diagnostic rooms, I have one of those tables where a patient sits and the table wheels around, you know, they get all these different pieces of equipment or they're moving chair to chair. So in this particular case, they sit in one chair. 
And it's really helpful too if you position it the right way for patients for wheelchairs because it's a slit lamp um, like you know device so it can do all of this. It really saves from moving that patient all around. So um, this is a preview of the anterior segment summary screen on the VX120 plus dry eye. This is what that summary screen looks like for you on your screen right here. The patient experience is so enhanced. This right here, if we look at this, this shows you the um, anterior corneal topography screen. So this is what that portion looks like. Then we also have higher order aberration screen to look at. And there you see that. It's amazing, amazing technology that this equipment can get all of these different things with one sitting for the patient. Here's the uh, VX120 Plus dry eye eye care provider review, um, showing you a lot of different things on one screen here. So here's an example of, you know, you got, you got your provider, or the, I guess this could be a technician as well, you know, um, looking at screens and educating the patient. Look at all of these images, the red eye images, it measures the red eyes. It just looks at so many different things for the patients that help the patient understand, oh my, that is my eye on that screen. Uh, the doctor instantly receives the data because once you do this, they do an ER, EMR integration into your EMR so it can immediately come up on your desktop wherever you need it to see it. The patient can view the color images um, and be engaged in their own care easily um, integrate disease state management into patient workflow, which is what we're after right here. The create more touch points to engage the patient, quick return appointments. So if you wanted to bring the patient back for a quick follow-up and you wanted to look at something specific where you could have the technician gain that image um, and get all of that. And, you know, almost in our office, we have like what we call a dry eye follow-up screen or dry eye follow-up schedule. And on that particular schedule, we have things where the technician's just gathering an osmolarity or an inflamma dry or a lip of view or a meniscus height or something like this so that they can gather the um, information interim for the doctor to see back in the next visit. Because sometimes those interim visits, along with a speed form, we use a lot of uh, speed, which is the standard patient evaluation of eye dryness. These things together to create your diagnostics work really well. We also add for ours, um, you know, we're doing, for doing the Visionics, we're also doing osmolarity, inflammatory, dry, and then we really want images of the myobian glands. So with those specific things in place, you really could put all of this into one little counseling office, gather all this knowledge together, and then see the patient um, to review everything in the exam room and be ready to roll and make some treatment options, you know, for the patient. So let's look a little bit at the dry eye module and what it looks like. This particular image right here, you know, shows you that meniscus height and you can see the, um, the way it measures and it um, charts it off for you. Here are the VisiX, you know, the VisiX 120 dry eye. So we've got tear, tear breakup time, which is important. We have the tear meniscus volume, full color imaging, um, and the clinical grading scales, which you can see here, which are important. And that, you know, one of the things we did too is we developed a dry eye flow sheet in our office so we could keep these scores and images, the speed scores and certain things, so we can look at the changes in them when we're seeing the patients in follow up. So, one of the things we know when you start treating dry eye patients and they start doing home care, when you see them back in follow-up, one of the first things they want to know is, you know, how, how, how am I better? Speed score can definitely tell you if you're better. Measurements can tell you if they're better. The redness can tell them. I mean, there's just all of these different things when you show them the changes that can help them see that actually you are getting better. And of course, comfort is a big thing for them. So if you use a combination of tests to get to the root cause of the patient issues, 
is what we're trying to do here. So if we put this into place, and again, as I said, we add speed, we add osmolarity and inflammadry, and then we add gland imaging. You've pretty got much got your diagnostics right here to help you figure out what's going on with this particular patient. And, you know, aqueous deficiency, is it really severe blepharitis going on? Is it my booming gland dysfunction going on? All of these things, you can start to see where the patient sits and start creating that treatment plan of offering one of the treatment options available for them. Here's the dry eye summary screen that you, you would be able to see. Pretty interesting. It's got, you know, the limbal redness, conjunctival redness, blepharitis. All of these measurement scales are here for the patient for you. My booming and gland dysfunction. You can see the patient's eyes. You're storing all of this data, which is extra cool to be able to look at and go back later. Here's the meniscus height, the tear meniscus height and the measurements. So as previously discussed, you know, what are the practical benefits of adding this type of equipment um, to take care of dry eye patients within your office? So, you know, as previously discussed, you've got the obviously small footprint. Many of us, if we've been in practices for a while, we don't, you know, how do we add on space? We can't expand uh, square footage wise. So we have to learn how to make the most out of every piece of square foot we have. And, you know, there's some measurements out there where people actually calculate the reimbursement per square footage in their practice. So when you look at something like this, being able to add it, you know, what would be the enhanced uh, revenue stream that would come in? Well, we all know that when we do screenings and we then use education from those screenings for patient, that's where the capture comes into place. If you're just using a speed when the patient comes in or you just do an osmolarity and you tell them a score, that's great and that score helps you, but if they can't see for themselves what's going on to be able to capture and close maybe for a lip of low or for an eye lux or say a uh, tear care, any of those specific treatments, you know, you've just got to have data to show them. So the small footprint's more bang for your buck with all of these tools in that one specific box. Um, to my knowledge, and I mean, I could be wrong, but to my knowledge, and I've been around now for 40 some years, I don't know of any other single device that has this much to offer for the value that they have on it. Uh, the quickness, the efficiency with easy, ease of training, and we've all got the staff issues, and I don't know about you, but right now with COVID, my staffing issues are harder than normal between people being out with possible exposure and having to train somebody new or people deciding they don't want to work or they want to get something where they can work from home because that's a bit to do right now. You want something that you can train your staff on quickly and easily and help them understand so that they can help you. And that's the one thing with dry eye. You as a provider could not do all of the dry eye diagnostics, all of the dry eye gathering of information yourself. If so, it'll take you longer to do these exams. So with a piece of equipment like this, a quick speed score from the technician, a quick osmolarity, a quick inflammatory to see if we have any inflammation, you walk into the room and you've got all the data you need to go ahead and, you know, offer treatment options, offer prescriptions, offer products. You know, you might be offering products. You might be um, offering a bluff X to the patient because you can see the blepharitis going on. All of these things and even your staff could offer at that point. You can create these trigger points where if they see the blepharitis and the grading of the blepharitis that they turn around and say, hey, you know, this right here. Dr. Smith may want to offer this for you. Would that be something you'd be interested in? And you can easily add a couple of hundred with that particular patient one day doing a blepharitis treatment um, before the patient leaves the office. And it takes minutes to do that if you have your staff ready to roll and you're quick and you're efficient. If you aren't handling dry eye care right now, I don't know of an easier way for you to actually get started in it than to use um, something like this and add it to your arsenal. So, you know, it's ideal for eye care providers to get started. And that was one of my things. When I looked at this, you know, I looked at all the practices we've helped over the years and all the, all the things we have. And we have satellite offices as well. 
And one of the things I see that is the most fascinating about this is that it's ideal for eye care providers to get started with dry eye disease. It is, you don't have to go out and buy five different boxes. You don't have to have huge square footage to do it. You can put all of this in one, you know, small footprint and be able to jumpstart this and get moving right away. Um, the practice benefits, obviously, you could be able to market this a little, advertise it a little bit. We were talking earlier, you know, I, um, you always want to educate your referral network. If you have somebody referring to you, maybe primary care providers, and now they know you're taking care of dry eye, what would be great is to send them, you know, a letter, show them some of the images and the things that are provided and the things they can provide, you can provide for them for their medical record for patients and really wow them so that they'll want to send patients over specifically for dry eye. Lots of patients go into primary care offices with dry eye complaints too. They have allergies, they have dry eyes, maybe they have Sjogren's, maybe they have, you know, other um, disorders going on where those eyes are really affected and the patients um, need somewhere to go. They're looking for somewhere to go. So lots of practice benefits, lots of patient benefits. Patients are more satisfied if they feel like they're listened to and they feel like they're offered a solution for what they came for. So many times the patients come into our offices and we're offering them contact lenses or glasses or in the MD case, they're offering cataract surgery. And you can go and you can look at the chief complaint in that chart and the patient's like, you know, my eyes are irritated, my eyes are dry. And the number one chief complaint that I always emphasize is fluctuating vision. And when a patient has fluctuating vision, it is always the ocular surface doing that. It's not their cataract, it's the ocular surface. And if we can get the ocular surface under control where it's not fluctuating, many times you can hold off on cataract surgery for a while. Because what's gonna happen after they have cataract surgery, the patient's still gonna have um, fluctuating vision because the surface is still gonna be messed up. And not for anything, but the medications that the doctors give the patients when they're having surgery, you know, are somewhat toxic to that surface and can affect the surface as well. So treating the ocular surface prior to um, cataract surgery or anterior segment surgery can make any eye care provider look like a genius. I've seen this particular quote show up in a lot of different places. Dr. Bowden um, originated this quote, but I know several other doctors that are using it and saying they did. <laughs> But this is the way we looked at it. We looked at, you know, how much hand-holding we're redoing after cataract surgery or after refractive surgery for patients. How many times were we explaining to a patient, no, you had a great result from cataract surgery, you had a great result from your LASIK, what's really bothering you right now is your dry eye. And the patient would look at us like, well, I didn't have dry eye before I had the surgery, but indeed they did. We just didn't fully detect it. We didn't fully tell them that they had it. Now we've enhanced it and made it where it's obvious to them and they're frustrated. So if we treat them beforehand, we tell them beforehand, we give them options. Not all of them will go for the treatment. We give them options and we tell them, this is what's going on and you're gonna notice this more afterwards. Then you can kind of like, you know, be a genius because you have told them about the problems they have. Um, you know, how is it possible for practices to really jump into this and get going? I can tell you that I've helped so many practices get started with dry eye and there's nothing more fulfilling for that doctor or their manager or whoever to come back later and say, I don't even know what we were doing before. You know, all of these patients have been coming. We're suddenly paying attention, you know, back to that thing. If all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Well, we also use, you know, if you don't take temperatures, you don't find fevers. But when you start treating dry eye and you start looking for it in a case like this, using a screening device to really find it, the treatment options are just gonna go through the roof for you and you're just gonna increase that revenue stream. And what we're gonna lose right now or in 2021 with cuts again, this will easily replace that with more once you get this into place and get it going. So with that, um, you know, obviously you can schedule a virtual demonstration um, of this particular equipment um, and they can make that happen for you. But also, are there any questions? Does anybody have any questions that they would like to ask that maybe I can help you with? I may not, um, but I, I will certainly try. 
All right. Well, well, thank you, Patty. Yeah, I'm certain we have questions up there. And in fact, if you have any questions, feel free to use the little Q&A box on the right side of your screen. You can pop that out again with a little orange arrow uh, and you can uh, come and ask questions. The first question, of course, someone asks, is there any chance the recording will be available later? And the answer is absolutely. Uh, we'll be here. Uh, this video um, will be available on demand on OD Wire um, if you don't see it uh, later. Um, so I guess, uh, you know, just diving into some of the questions here, I guess I can try to try to go chronologically uh, and, uh, you know, ask some questions. So the first question is in terms of dry eye screening. Now, is this something that you do for every patient that walks through the door routinely as, as part of your pretest, or is this is this device something that only you give to people who maybe have already expressed that they're having dry eye symptoms? You know, it's an interesting thing. With this piece of equipment, you could do it with everyone because you're obtaining this data so quickly. Um, screenings are an interesting thing for me. You know, I've done things where we only provide things for people who uh, meet certain um, guidelines. The problem is because so many dry eye patients can be asymptomatic as well. And I think in a lot of optometry practices where you have contact lens patients coming and going, especially so many of them, the number one reason for failure we know is the ocular surface. So if we can screen those patients ahead of time and you know, for your, you can teach your technician to do this because they would be getting pressure at the same time, you know, they would be getting, you know, all of the, the refraction, the auto refraction and everything done at one time. So why not go ahead and shoot this into there? And that way you can use it to address it and then um, close to get some of the treatment options or the things that add a lot of revenue to your um, bottom line. Now, I know I've worked with ODs as well that do screenings on certain things and they have like a screening fee where we're gonna screen this, this, and this, and they charge a technology fee or whatever to do those screenings. So I think there's a lot of different options you can do there. Right, uh, question here. So the question is, does this replace a pachymeter? And actually what you mentioned, it replaces four different instruments. What, what are the instruments that it can replace in, in your pretest area? So you've got um, the autorefractor, you've got pachymetry, you've got corneal topography, you've got the meniscus height, You've got, um, let's see, what else we got? Retroillumination. Um, there's, you know, all of those different things. Let me look here. You got, um, it's got an eye tracking and measurement, remote viewing access, wavefront refraction, uh, corneal topography, non contact tonometry, pachymetry, posterior corneal elevation maps, and then, of course, what the dry eye module is offering you as well. Wow. Okay, so it's a real Swiss Army knife. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's why my docs were like, we could put this in the trunk and go to the mall. Yeah, and speaking of that, actually, because that's another question, in terms of ease of use, you, you put up a few pictures of the user interface for folks to look at. Um, if you have techs in your office, are, are they pretty easy to, to train on the device, or does this require doctor intervention at any time? No, we actually, you know, um, I had several, a couple of my docs would use it, but my technicians used it most to provide, get the data, gather the data, so that the docs could pull it up on the screen in the exam room and, you know, um, help diagnose and help offer treatments for the patients. It's easy to train and, um, you know, the company will come out and train. Um, I'm assuming they do that for everyone. You'd have to check with them. But they also have videos. They have tutorials. But my staff embraced it super quickly. And like I said, um, we had a, I know of a four-year-old that we put in front of this machine to test and it was so easy to get all the data on him. Uh, that's a good question, actually, because somebody asked that too. Are there any age limitations uh, when you use the machine? So I guess, you know, pretty, pretty young kids can use it. I'm not sure what Lanou technology actually uh, recommends, but like I said, we went as low as four. We didn't try anybody younger, and we probably went as high as about 99. Um, on our usage because that's what our life looks like in our office. We have all different ages coming in and we didn't find a limitation on it at all. Sure. Oh, question here, this is actually a question that I had, so I'm glad somebody asked it, because I went to the website and I couldn't figure it out. Do you know the difference between the 120 and the 120 plus models? Well, yes, 120 plus and the 120. Mm, that might be a uh, question for uh, the company. Um, I think the 120 
might not have the posterior corneal elevation. Um, I know the 120 plus dry eye has the dry eye module on it, but that would be a question I think to ask the representative. I'm not a salesman, so I wouldn't want to mislead you. Question a person has uh, here, how does this integrate with uh, your EMR in your office? And I guess more to the point then, how does it integrate with the workflow that you have? Uh, when they come in and they set it up, they helped uh, um, integrate it into ours for us so we could pull it up. Um, and it didn't seem to be a hard thing to do and my staff didn't complain about it. So um, it was easily to get it to the workrooms. So the exam room, they could pull it up right there for the doctor to have it up on the screens. Right. So as part of the actual setup, they handled that for you. They helped yes, you actually they get the thing up and integrated. So that's the, it's designed to be able to do that because, I, I, you know, for flow and efficiency, what else could we possibly expect? We would have to have that to be efficient. Okay. Oh, I have an answer to the question about the 120 versus the 120 plus. So the official answer here is the VX120 plus dry eye has dry eye screening. The VX120 does not. So I right. guess that's what plus means. So there we yep. go. <laughs> so th thank you, folks at Luno, for, for helping us with that. Uh, qu question here. Um, do you know offhand the, the range of the, the cost of, of each unit? I am sorry, I do not have that information. I always encourage my um, physicians and staff that come to Dry University to negotiate, negotiate, negotiate. <laughs> <laughs> always good advice. And yes. a, question, a question here, do you know anything about health insurance codes for the different exams uh, that, that you may use with the VX120. Is this something that, that you ever deal with or is that sort yeah. of a back office thing? So. Oh, no. Um, yeah, you know, there's multiple things within what you're doing with this technology that are billable to insurance. But you can also set up things that, you know, um, aren't and have a self-pay code for that or self-pay fee for that as well. But when you look at pachymetry, if you're doing uh, pachymetry, you can bill for pachymetry. I mean, that's covered. Um, if you're billing for um, anterior segment photography of any chart, you know, like images, um, there are things you can bill for in that. Um, I'm one that I tend to look at, you know, the lip scans and the lip abuse and the um, my bony gland images as a non-covered service, but that's a great area out there. And I know a lot of people bill those to insurance, um, but it's not hard to um, set up a screening fee or technology screening fee and be able to give them a bundle of services. All of that just depends on the time it takes your technician to provide it for you, right? Um, but the more you screen, the more you capture. Yep. Question here, you mentioned that you show uh, patients the screen um, to sort of show them what their eyes look like. Is that something that you do routinely, just you know, as you're treating them to show them their progress, or is it something that you only do occasionally? It depends on the patient and you know, your average, say if you have a vision exam coming through and everything's normal, we probably wouldn't take the time to show them you know, that. We're not gonna show them normal things. Um, we tend to use the images to show abnormalities or if a patient had a complaint that there was nothing wrong and we could show them, look, you look perfectly normal here, we could use it in that um, manner. But to be able to show them, for instance, the blepharitis or the red eye grading screen where they could see that, I think that's invaluable when you're educating a patient because, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words, they say. Absolutely. Yeah, let me let me see some other questions that we have here. Oh my gosh, so many! I got, I got to pick from a few here. <laughs> um, so, let's see. Oh, question about your business model for for dry eye in general. So this is actually going a little bit away from the device itself. Mm -hmm. um, how do you actually bill for this when you, when you see a patient and you say prescribe courses of treatment, whatever it is? Do you just do it on a a, a visit by visit basis, or do you set up sort of plans for treating their dry eye? So it's an interesting question. Most of ours are done visit by visit. Some things are bundled. For instance, if a patient has an a MGD treatment, um, we may do um, imaging uh, ahead of time, like the meniscus layer, you know, height, the meniscus height. We may measure that. We may do um, the blepharitis showing the lids and how bad that is, do a blepharitis treatment, and then maybe do a MGD treatment, such as an ILUX or Lipaflow or whatever. And then um, when we see them back, we may repeat those images at no charge for them um, to show them the comparisons. 
Um, in my particular practice, I'm one where I'm not a freebie type person. I tend to charge for everything we do um, because I think, you know, my opinion is people value things they pay for. Um, and we're super, super busy. If you're trying to grow a portion and you want to offer screenings or you want to do, for instance, a dry eye seminar where you had somebody come in and you offer complimentary screenings to excite them and show them the abnormalities and then draw them in for treatments. Lots of different things you can do. Um, diagnostics as a whole, when you look at um, osmolarity or you look at Inflamadry, the MMP9, those are billable to insurance, but utilization are big um, concerns. You have to be careful how you utilize that. So for us, we bill the insurance when we can and we charge the patient when we can't. But if we need the test, we need the test. So yes, in our standard of care, we design that into the standard and we advise the patients ahead of time. Our technicians or we use a dry eye counselor to really educate the patient on what the expense will be ahead of time. If they're coming in for specific dry eye evaluation or dry eye treatment, they always know ahead of time what their fees are going to be and what we expect to collect at the front desk before they even get to the back office. Right. And I guess final question here is along the similar lines. How frequently do you see patients back? Let's say your MGD patients. How, how frequently do you have them back in to assess how the treatments are going? Well, what we found in our particular practice and in our teachings is that you know, first off of, you know, 100 dry eye patients, probably 75 to 80 of them are going to have some sort of MGD, level of MGD that needs to be treated. But most of those patients, it's multifactorial. So they may have aqueous deficiency. They may have, you know, lots of different things going on, exposure, allergies. We're on, depending on the treatment we implement for the patient, we're probably seeing these patients in the beginning six to eight weeks to see you know, if we've added sequa, restasis, zydra, or something like that to see how they're doing. Um, and then, you know, we'll start spacing them out a little bit. Those speed scores are important every visit. But we try to keep them engaged and see them at least four times a year. Because if you don't, you'll see them back and they'll be just like if they came in with a monked up cornea and it's in really bad shape and you get them under control and then you don't see them again for a year, they're going to come back looking the way they did the first time. So keeping them engaged, it's like a diabetic or somebody with hypertension where you have to monitor it. And when you monitor it, you help keep them under control. Right. And then perhaps being able to show them the pictures over time, you know, if they oh, yes. kind of regress, you can show them like, by the way, this is how good it looked six months ago. You know, you don't want to fall back to the way it was before you started treatment. <laughs> great, great point. Because if, you know, if you get a patient who feels like they have a little bit of a buyer's remorse and maybe they spent money on a, a MGD treatment, and now they're back and they say, you know, I'm not any better, but you can do these images and show them how much better, or you did a blepharitis debridement or something, and you can show them how much better that lid lash line looks. I mean, you've got it. You've got the information right there to share with them. Absolutely. All right. Well, Patty, it looks like we're running out of time here, but thank you so much for, for you know, catching us up to speed on all this. And I know that, you know, all this information is on Luno's site and this will be available online as well. Uh, and I know on ODWire people like to ask questions. So we, once we put the archive up, maybe you could come on and, uh, and answer yeah. the questions as, as people come. Sure. Be happy to. Again, Patty, thank you for coming and, th and thanks everyone for turning out tonight. And I guess I'll see everyone online. Thank you.